This is Snake. Do you read me, Otacon? Ah, I can hear you. But I'm not a Otacon. I'm a Kojima Hideo. What? Snake, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. They are the only one who is a fiction of Metal Gear Solid. We need to get a fix on who they are. That's right. They are the only one who is a f***er. Maybe they are the only one who is a f***er. Well, I think they are the only one who is a f***er. From 1987 to 2015, a video game series repeatedly changed the world. That series is Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear, and this, a long-form series of virtual essays, tells the story of its design. In episode 1, we'll cover the creation of the original title on the MSX2 computer, Kojima's very first game, 1987's Metal Gear. <laughs> It is the early 1980s. Thanks to bad business practices, the burgeoning video game industry, in the West anyway, has crashed. The mammoth monopoly held by Atari goes extinct. Rising in its wake are Japanese companies, companies like Nintendo. At the same time, a new protocol has the power to standardize hardware and software specifications onto a single template. Created jointly by Microsoft and Japanese company ASCII, this new lingua franca will be called Machines with Software Exchangeability, or MSX. Let's explain. If you haven't heard of the MSX, it's a computer standard that was created in Japan in the early 1980s. It helped unite various manufacturers on which components they would use inside their computers, regardless of if a system was purchased from Panasonic, Sony, Sanyo, Casio, Yamaha, Philips, Daewoo, or others, MSX consumers could purchase and run software they knew would be compatible with their machine. The standard spans four generations, the MSX, MSX2, MSX2+, Plus, and the MSX Turbo R. The MSX is not a PC like we think of one today. The word PC does not yet exist. Companies currently build their own hardware and software jointly in closed systems without outside compatibility. MSX is devised as one of many rival such standards for the era, a candidate for a cross between the software industry looking for a common hardware and the hardware industry looking for a common software suite. The MSX succeeds in lots of regions except one, one still under the spell of that grandmaster champion of its era, the Commodore 64, America. But in Japan, the MSX series becomes pivotal to the development of the gaming scene, right alongside other region-specific platforms like the PC-88 and 98 series computers by Nippon Electric NEC. With companies like Sony manufacturing the machines that fit the MSX2 specifications, the actual developers merely create games to match those specs. Then Sony often doubles as the publisher. 
but many of these developer studios in the early 80s in Japan are still known for arcade titles. It will be in the earliest arrangements between these developers and publishers like Sony that the seeds for the Japanese games industry as we know it today will be truly planted. Starting in 1983, one such arcade dev company works with Sony as its new publisher, named Konami. Soon enough, Konami drops Sony and begin publishing their own games. And by the late 80s, Konami becomes a major name in all three branches of the Japanese industry, arcades, consoles, and home computers. Where Konami truly dominates is the MSX releasing killer apps for the platform like Castlevania in 1986. It is this same year of 1986 that a young and inexperienced rookie joins Konami named Hideo Kojima. Kojima already spends most of his free time at the arcades. Recently, his life changed forever by playing not two arcade games, but two Famicom titles. <laughs> The Portopia Serial Murder Case and Super Mario Bros. まあ、将来は画家とかそういうアーティストになりたかったんですけども、Having tried his hand as a director and a writer, out of options and out of school, Looked down on by his family and friends, Kojima joins Konami in the vain hope he'll someday become the truly important creative voice of his dreams. I settled on Konami, not because of the types of games they were making, they were the only games company to be listed on the stock exchange at the time. Hideo Kojima, 2014. But he imagines he'll do this either on the Famicom or the arcade cabinet. The first place Konami assigns their new rookie, the one platform he hates, the MSX. Quote, it was really disappointing because they assigned me to the MSX division. I had joined a company in the games industry wanting to make Famicom or arcade games, and then I was assigned to MSX. Back then, MSX had only 16 colors, and on top of that, if you excluded all the colors that were hard to use, such as pink or purple, you were left with only 8. Hideo Kojima, 2007 Unfortunately for young Kojima, Konami sees the MSX series as its platform. Konami needs all lower-ranking staff like himself working on MSX games. Kojima's first job in the industry is assistant producer on the MSX title Penguin Adventure, released again the same year, 1986. Similar to Konami's Ganbare Gomon series, not to mention the game's own predecessor, Antarctic Adventure in 1983, Penguin Adventure is a zany, extremely Japanese game. It's rooted in local Japanese traditions and culture, making it by default a Japanese exclusive. 
Like other Konami games, Penguin Adventure is a curious hybrid of design styles. It mixes action, RPG, and racing game elements, replete with boss battles, currency, equipment, minigames, secret passages, easter eggs, and different endings. In one, the princess lives, in the other, she dies. Getting the good ending, and this is true, takes hitting pause a certain number of times. Retro Gamer will later call Penguin Adventure one of the finest, most tech-savvy games ever to appear on the MSX. The full extent of Kojima's contributions to the game, however, remain unknown. It's just a taste of the best that's yet to come. Following the project, Konami gives Kojima central authority over his own game for the first time. The result will be 1987's Metal Gear. There are two types of games. The first type is games as toys or playthings, the Nintendo way of thinking. The second type is games in which you assume the role of a character, who is not you, and experience the life of that character virtually. Hideo Kojima Computers in the late 80s are still in their infancy, and for many, video games are still toys. Kojima, now age 23, is okay with making toys, but he dreams one day of making worlds. Metal Gear will mark both its artist and the medium in transition, moving from the physical and mental spaces of the arcade to that of games in the computer and living rooms. Before becoming a game developer, as a youth, Kojima's dream jobs were astronaut and detective. Fittingly, then, his approach to video games has the daring spirit of adventure and technological experimentation of spaceflight with the attention to detail and to psychology of any private eye. Though that voice, like any artist's, will take time to develop. Kojima learns from the best at the company. The MSX division at Konami winds up being the best place for him, for reasons we'll get to shortly. Kojima studies how Konami's MSX games are made, while brainstorming ways he can apply these lessons to his lifelong goal of creating narratives with a real impact. Nobody believes in video games, let alone in Hideo Kojima. He spends an embarrassing amount of time at Konami before finishing a single game. The first major project he attempts on his own will be known later under the working title Lost World. Starring female protagonist Jamie, the game would have taken place on board the Titanic. It seems this will eventually morph into Kojima's second ever game, Snatcher. Lost World is officially rejected. Kojima envisions completely turning video game traditions on their head. Instead of constant combat with the enemy as you plowed further inside their base, Kojima's new idea is a game where you're trying to avoid the enemy as you escape out. He'll tell MSX Magazine in August of 1990, quote, I had my doubts about action games where all you do was shoot enemies. I was thinking about ways to express the thrill and suspense from spy films or adventure novels, which action games at the time were lacking, end quote. But this project, tentatively titled Intruder, also gets rejected. Meanwhile, a separate project within Konami's MXX division teeters on the brink of cancellation. Ordered as a knockoff of the popular Capcom run-and-gun arcade title Commando, except one for the MSX, all that's left of this military action title is the codename, known internally as Project N312. The senior Konami developer initially tasked with leading production can't complete his mission. But just before canceling Project N312 altogether, Konami hands control over to Kojima. And while the idea of knocking off Commando will blossom from a separate Konami team as 1987's Contra, Project N312 will become, of course, Metal Gear, a game about a secret mission in 313. Kojima takes the skeleton for the military action game and works back in elements from Intruder, his rejected escape adventure game. 
pretty quickly, Kojima determines that story has a totally different function in video games. Apart from how a game's story has to fit within certain parameters, fundamentally the role of the audience changes. Because really, games have no audience, per se. Games only have players. You're not only part of the story. The purpose at the end of the day of story in video games is to serve or service the gameplay. And that's obviously completely different from movies or books. As a format, the point of the arcade game, its charm you might say, is in its low attention span. You're in, you're out, you put another quarter in, repeat. Going very fast and loud, an arcade game affixes your attention in a permanent now. Continuing to play keeps you inside that feeling, that cocoon, that moment, frozen in time there forever, until you beat the game or just run out of lives or money. At this time, Konami is best established as an arcade company. Right away, Kojima runs into problems with some of the entrenched thinking this arcade pedigree brings. He'll tell MSX Magazine in 2005, quote, PC game companies such as Square and Enix understood what world building was about, and that's where planners like Yuji Horii, creator of the Dragon Quest series, came from, since their development infrastructure was completely different. But at Konami, there was this sort of mentality of making the player have a game over in one coin that was born from our arcade origin. It resulted in simple games. Those kinds of games were really rampant when I joined the company, so I would get angry whenever I was told that I only had a day to come up with the backstory of a game's world." End quote. What Kojima already sees is something starting to arrive. A new order is now underway. And in that new order of the TV and computer room video game, the dynamic from the arcade floor will be reversed. The whole essence of video games as they exist in the arcade will have to change. If arcade games are like running a treadmill, by its very nature, home gaming becomes more stationary, in some ways more linear, while in other ways less. By heading indoors and growing in size, games will become important as narrative experiences, Kojima realizes, and not only that. He intuits they'll become more private affairs, more intimate and personal objects of our fixation and delight. No differently than movies, albums, or novels, games are going to become things we'll really care about. Whole worlds in which we'll dive inside. As the hardware for this revolution is developing, Kojima recognizes how software developers and game designers like himself will likewise have to shift all their paradigms. It's becoming clear that, as it infiltrates more and more of daily life, digital technology will come in the early 21st century of the future to all but define people's lives. They'll also come to care very deeply about the kinds of culture and entertainment the kinds of immersion and artistry that this new information age brings. There's something about Japanese society in particular that seems to catalyze this momentous shift of the 1980s. Not only do Japanese characters take up less space and allow for bigger program files and higher resolution displays, something's happening in Japan itself that's turning the growing Japanese games scene into a full-fledged golden age. It's the era of the Japanese economic miracle, later known as the bubble. Money's around for all kinds of creative, important, and risky ventures. Comics and cartoons in Japan have joined forces in an unholy alliance with the VHS, TV, movie, and pornography industries. The result triggers a kind of renaissance, a Japanese cultural and technological tidal wave that propels the country, still healing from the scars of World War II, into major global importance, maybe for the first time. No medium is better poised to meet the challenges of this new era for both Japan and the world than Kojima's in video games. And all of this takes place right alongside the start of the era today we call globalization. For its potential audience, Japan now has the entire world. Unlike the film industry, so long dominated by Hollywood, the games industry is now completely up for grabs, and Japanese companies are poised to net the lion's share of influence and control over this burgeoning medium. This era obviously produced a flood of great games, many of them even today household names. The mid-1980s give way to the late.
A philosopher once said, a game is like a magic circle. And by the late 80s, the potential scope of that magic circle is, for video games, widening. 1986's seminal genre hybrid, Weebarm, used an early form of 3D polygons, and many new styles, techniques, and platforms in gaming start to proliferate. As much as Konami dominates on the MSX, at the end of the day, sales dictate where most of the money goes. That means that while the MSX division gets access to quality in-house dev tools and techniques of data compression, Windfall benefits from the Arcade and Famicom division's success. Since MSX titles never sell anywhere the number of those for Famicom and the Arcade, Konami, most of the time, just leaves the MSX division alone. Instead of Konami higher-ups, the MSX branch oversees its own projects, more often than not, on an ad hoc basis, almost as a kind of dev collective. Kojima will say later in 2005, there were typically four teams led by a different head designer. Quote, if one of them was putting out an uninteresting game, everyone would, for about a month, join forces to fix it, to help rebuild the game. End quote. But those four project leads were more than just developers. They were also something new, something at the time called the Game Planner. Because of the MSX's relative limitations and smaller user base, it takes a special class of designer to make Konami MSX games. This person, the game planner, not only helps conceptualize game scenarios, but oversees the wider game's creation, its bigger picture, how it all fits together, how at the end of the process, it actually runs and plays on the MSX. The MSX division is the only Konami branch with game planners at all. It's the position with which Kojima started his career, working on Penguin Adventure. It was from the other planners at Konami that Kojima learned everything he was now using to plan and design Metal Gear. It's just one of many reasons why the MSX is so inseparable from the story of the creation of Metal Gear. At Konami, we had this feeling games were somehow important to the future. We believed in the future of the medium, and that drove us to create the best work possible. Hideo Kojima, 2014. In this new age of gaming, discrete individual game types or scenarios or modes often combine to form something bigger and more immersive, ultimately something more meaningful in the form of the console or home computer game. Most MSX titles at this time are arcade adjacent. If they aren't bullet hells and shoot 'em ups, most have arcade staples like a high score meter, explicitly gated off stages, one hit kills, and so on. One title with surprising similarity to Metal Gear is 1986's Super Rambo Special. Based on the hit film First Blood Part II, the Japanese-only Super Rambo Special tasked you with rescuing POWs, finding keys and weapons, and prowling behind enemy lines, all just like Metal Gear a year later. However, Rambo lacked the fundamentals that would make Metal Gear great. There is no sense while playing that we're facing down an enemy with quasi-intelligence or awareness. Rambo lacks a real stealth system to speak of. And even as an action game, Rambo just isn't too well designed. It also lacks a strong voice. Super Rambo isn't even a decent adaptation of the source material's tone. Whether aware of Super Rambo special or not, Kojima will develop Metal Gear as something similar, but far, far more important. And crucially, he never sees games compared to movies or books as second rate. He isn't settling for anything by joining the games industry. Kojima recognizes the latent power of this medium right away. Entering the industry is just another way of him accomplishing the same goals. Kojima will later say it was the newness, the unproven quality of video games that mirrored his own, that most excited him. It was a powerful incentive, showing the world what both Kojima and this new art form could do. And it led to the kind of trailblazing, revolutionaries attitude that he'd take with him over the next 30 years of development and design. Kojima doesn't want to just treat games like any widget and merely meet the consumer's expectations. 
He knows games, from design to how they're played, are about leisure time. They aren't an essential commodity or technology, in other words. They're for enriching our lives in our free time. Why then, Kojima wonders, are so many in the industry focused only on achieving the bare minimum? More than just a fun distraction to pass the time, Kojima has faith that games one day will become the kinds of life-changing experiences that people also have with movies, music, or books. But it won't be for several games that Konami give Kojima completely primary influence over his own projects. The first Metal Gear, then, is something of a mix between a game by Hideo Kojima and a game by the Konami MSX staff. More than a few elements surrounding the production of the game will find their way into its story. Metal Gear depicts Solid Snake, a rookie operative, forced into a do-or-die adventure mission determining the fate of the world. In the plot, you're only sent in after your predecessor, the senior operative Gray Fox, goes MIA. The only thing Fox manages to report back before getting captured or killed are the words, Metal Gear. Uncovering the mystery of that phrase is really the point of the whole game. Legend has it that the phrase Metal Gear was one of the only things the original team behind N312 had produced. Others hold Metal Gear comes from the original game plan for Intruder, which supposedly would have used Metal Gear for its subtitle. Whatever the name's true origins, Metal Gear, of course, is a stealth game. Its primary influence is hide-and-seek. As a sneaking mission, Metal Gear forces you to use the environment immersively and in new ways for the medium. Those stealth games before Metal Gear had existed, like Wolfenstein and Sega's 005 back in 1981, this was more than just about keeping hidden from the bad guys or sneaking into an enemy base. Metal Gear is an adventure story, one that uses a detailed, if incompletely realized, game world to bring you into the action and suspense, blow by blow. One Konami game, 1986's Ganbare Gomon, made you track down passes and unique items to proceed. Another one, King Kong 2, sent you roaming across levels to fight bosses and solve puzzles in an exotic action-adventure setting. It combined RPG and action game elements with light sim game components, too. Your ending in King Kong 2 depended on how long in-game it took and with how many continues. Yet another crucial influence on Metal Gear will be Castlevania, a dungeon crawler action game. From Castlevania to Super Mario Bros, the big defining trait of Japanese home video games at this time is secrecy. Since 1985's Super Mario Bros, devs had figured out one way to differentiate their new games from arcade titles was with secret, even cryptic, features. These introduced a second layer of game to the primary experience, with more depth than you could find in an arcade. A sort of metagame, where players went off the beaten path and only found these secrets by approaching the same old gameplay completely differently. For example, secret warp zones in Super Mario could let you skip levels altogether, disrupting the normal game's linear progression across worlds in numerical order. No games were more cryptic, perhaps, than action-adventure titles with puzzles. This tradition is where Metal Gear was born. If we compare Metal Gear to its other Konami action title cousins, we'll find surprising similarity to titles like Castlevania and King Kong. All three games begin exactly the same, with our character's arrival at a perilous, exotic, and mysterious setting we'd spend inside the entire time. All three are fairly cryptic, hiding keys and paths in walls, confronting you with bosses before you know how to beat them, sprawling out in all directions with zero indication how to proceed, and backtracking paths that loop in on themselves. I should point out a very important point. Castlevania is significantly different on the MSX. 
It was localized in Europe first, which is why technically the MSX version is known in the West as Vampire Killer. Both titles, Castlevania and Vampire Killer, though, were named Akumajo Dorakura, or Demon Castle Dracula, in Japan. But the MSX version was the one to influence Metal Gear. It was the one with the maze-like level design and secret keys. It was the one, like Metal Gear, to feature not side-scrolling, but very MSX-centric flip screens. Of the three, Metal Gear may actually be, as an action game, the worst. But what makes it special, when it debuts in 1987, is its unusual, even counterintuitive, design. In other games of the time, we find lots of the same features as Metal Gear. Different weapons, key cards, unlockables, sprawling level layouts, tense boss battles, the works. But here's the thing. In other games, going all the way back roughly to at least Super Mario Bros in 1985, enemies almost always know right away where you were and flocked right to you. That gave these games the gripping sense that you could also find somewhat in arcades of going through one long action scene with the player engaging in an endless shootout to save our lives. Examples of this readily abound from Mario to Mega Man to Contra and Castlevania. Metal Gear, meanwhile, introduced the concept of enemies that acted more human like us. And of a pacing that had dynamics to it. That wasn't just off-on, a single note, a single feeling. In Metal Gear, enemies are not omniscient or infallible. The enemy can be fooled by hiding or disguises. The enemy can fall asleep. We see them in more than one mode of activity. Subtly, this made things feel a little more real. Unlike other games, where enemies tended to go along fixed routes and displayed a limited range of intelligence on the fly, in Metal Gear, you make an action and the game reacts. The guards seem to recognize you when spotted and adapt accordingly. That's pretty new. You push forward with force or fight to retreat. You sabotage the enemy's equipment or pilfer their supply lines. But no matter how you engage or avoid the enemy and other obstacles in Metal Gear, the action typically remains a tactical choice. Unlike nearly every other game of its time, the action is always temporary. It always has a level of risk versus reward. Sometimes in Metal Gear, it's better, game strategy-wise, not to fight. It's in these tense, quieter moments. Metal Gear manages to be suspenseful in ways that games yet hadn't. The game's wider pacing better resembles the ebb and flow of storytelling. While arcade-style games simply turned on or off, Metal Gear has shades to it, gradations, if you will. Metal Gear will innovate a systematized game model, where the rules and modes flexibly depend on a direct back and forth, a conversation even, with the player, through the language of gameplay. In, say, Super Mario Bros. 85, you had but one objective. Move right, defeat enemies, and dodge obstacles, all to make it to the stage's ending flagpole. In Contra, meanwhile, your objective is in the genre name, to run and gun. Metal Gear, by contrast, offers many different gameplay scenarios, mechanics, and objectives, perhaps in such a large number to compensate for the MSX2's limited audiovisual prowess. Alongside the quiet, loud, quiet dynamic of the game's core hide-and-seek gameplay loop, Many environmental threats lie beyond just the enemy humans. Threats like trapped floor mazes, gas corridors, and rolling pulverizers. For an action game, Metal Gear 87 can be as cryptic as a text-heavy adventure game. It features unusual equipment and items for the era. 
that seem to verge on proto-sim game territory. Instead of your usual fare like power-ups and new weapons, often items have special and context-sensitive uses in Metal Gear you'll have to figure out before you can even execute. There's an enemy uniform you'll have to don to infiltrate a new building, an antenna that unjams your radio, a parachute for jumping into a restricted region off the roof. Gameplay-wise, Metal Gear is only action about 40% of the time. Compared to, say, Castlevania or Contra, that's low. The remaining 60% is made up of puzzle solving. dungeon sweeping, backtracking, search and rescue, and investigation. Primarily, you're looking for POWs, weapons and items, and key cards, which will be necessary to move forward. The enemy fortress city, Outer Heaven, is no less gigantic than a typical level layout in Castlevania. Pathways in Outer Heaven twist in on themselves, sometimes forking off into dead ends, or onto spots that you won't come back to for hours. Just getting around and tracking down intel sources here behind enemy lines is time-consuming and nerve-wracking enough. In this war of attrition which the industry had never seen before, the less you engaged the enemy, often the better. This is just one of countless examples of how Metal Gear, by feat of design genius, converts the MSX2's weaknesses into the title's own strengths. It was difficult working on the original MSX since sprites would disappear when you lined them up next to each other and the graphics were monochromatic. It was pretty painful. There aren't that many bullets on screen, they wouldn't come out horizontally either. Back then I think you could only move in six directions. Essentially the MSX couldn't surpass the arcade nor the Famicom, at least not in terms of graphics and sounds. Therefore, we had no choice but to make a game that could be done without enemies. And that's what allowed me to develop Metal Gear. Hideo Kojima, 2005. But the rules of engagement themselves became unique. There is rudimentary cover-based shooting, which is unusual. Weapons make noise. You can wander off camera and wind up right in the enemy's line of sight next screen. Just navigating the environment and figuring out what to do next are both major challenges compared perhaps to other action games. Simply put, Metal Gear is the first entry in a genre that draws from many others but doesn't actually have a name of its own yet. That genre draws not only from war epics and spy thrillers like The Great Escape, James Bond, and Guns of Navarone, it also draws from pulp action and adventure novels. Use binoculars to spy on adjacent squares, duck cameras inside a cardboard box, sniff out mines and plot hikes by compass in a desert, travail down dank caverns armed only with a dim flashlight, scuba down a secret waterway, dodge pitfalls while slapping off and on gas masks and scavenging for keycards, war material, and POWs in need of rescue. Metal Gear was every young boy's, every adventurous heart's dream. Even the way the enemy immediately respawned upon you leaving had its own kind of consistency. This was, after all, the heart of the enemy base, and that was why taking them on directly so often was suicide. Their endless numbers make not only the action scenes, but the stealth scenarios, too, all the more engaging. But there were some areas where, unusually, no enemies were to be found. For instance, the earliest several tiles in the game, you'll find, are empty. This gave new players a second to acclimate to the game while ratcheting up the suspense, the tension, the thrills. And similarly, any time in Metal Gear where guards aren't around, keeps the player waiting for the inevitable shoe to drop. The suspenseful tension between sneaking and confrontation was at the heart of Metal Gear. A lot of the same fundamentals Metal Gear establishes will remain basically intact over the next near three decades of the series, and some ideas won't be realized until the last Kojima MGS in 2015, The Phantom Pain. But even if, say, Spotlights at Night and other examples weren't possible yet on the MSX2, the game still gave us all those essential features of stealth action of the series that it would later spawn. Primarily, the gameplay involves tracking down sources of intel, 
subterfuge, or sabotage, usually using explosives. Rarely, but memorably, you'll also encounter bosses and enemy vehicles to take down, after first figuring out how to fight them. Overall, it's a very dynamic game concept and that concept's execution that arguably brings a degree of emotional range and dynamism rare for the medium at the time. And strangest of all, Metal Gear also somehow retains aspects of the feeling of an arcade game, like the kind Kojima wanted to make to begin with. Save points are placed in remote safe locations like the elevator shafts, which is where you tend to respawn. That makes each loop back into danger feel like hitting a new continue in a tough arcade game. You start memorizing your route, comparing your results. Can you make it to the next room with no alerts or minimal violence, or at the very least less violence than last time? Metal Gear's recursive loops pushed you to improve your own performance. It is out of these primitive dynamics the essence of what will become Metal Gear Solid is born. But another crucial design element are the lengthy cutscenes and radio calls. However, unfortunately, due to size issues, most of the cutscenes for Metal Gear will get cut. Even then, the game will still be too wordy once translated out of Japanese. This results in even further cuts in the European and American releases. According to members of the team, development of 1990's Metal Gear 2 will be driven by the pain of these phantom cutscenes, lost to history. But even in this trimmed down version, some traces of a more story heavy Metal Gear remain. One character, Resistance member Jennifer, won't help you beat the game before you achieve a rank 4 promotion from rescuing hostages. All the other characters like Schneider, Big Boss, and Diana change radio frequencies mid-game to throw off the enemy. These nice small flourishes combine storytelling and interactivity in groundbreaking ways. The best two features by far, narrative-wise anyway, have to be this. Metal Gear's context-sensitive, often missable radio calls, and the way your XO, Big Boss, constantly trolls the hell out of you only to be revealed by the very end as your secret, true antagonist. Quote, I create games, not stories. I merely include story elements that are necessary for the game to work. Hideo Kojima, 2005. One ongoing struggle for the medium of video games is the relationship between player and player character. And this is something Kojima with Metal Gear already seems to realize. Though a conventional story, Metal Gear also functions as a kind of hybrid, light RPG. Higher ranks bring bigger maximum supplies of ammo and rations, almost like leveling up. Snake, our stand-in, rarely talks. Like us, he's a rookie in way out of his depth. Like many player characters of his era, all these features leave Snake an open question, a blank space, in ways that are only appropriate in video games. That are necessary for the actual player to project themselves into. Yet on the other hand, Snake also has a linear, traditional storyline that he follows. As we play, we uncover what our predecessor, the MIA Commando Gray Fox, meant by the mysterious codename Metal Gear. Metal Gear is a bipedal walking nuclear tank. We meet its creator, Dr. Madnar, and find he's being forced to work for the enemy by them kidnapping his daughter Ellen. It's all building to the big dramatic climax. Other curious narrative elements survived. For example, Diane, the character you can't even talk to until you get to rank 4, develops feelings for you, which in pure Hollywood fashion seem to grow over the course of the game. In a nice human touch, Dr. Madnar can't remember the exact method of taking down Metal Gear when the time comes to tell you. This suspenseful uncertainty raises the drama and excitement of the eventual showdown itself. 
It's only after we defeat Metal Gear, though, that we come face to face with our true enemy. It turns out Big Boss has sent you in as an elaborate ruse, designed to feed his own country with this information. Refusing to die alone now that his coup d'etat has failed, Big Boss is the final enemy of the game. After defeating him and evading a self-destruct sequence, Metal Gear ends. We close with Snake listening to news reports of mysterious seismic tremors near Galsburg, South Africa. That's all the public will ever know of your adventure, now that every trace of evidence has gone up in flames. In one of the most important moments of the game for Kojima's later development as an artist, Big Boss, nearly unmasked near the end, breaks the fourth wall. He tells you to shut off your MSX immediately. This is after our commander, Big Boss, has spent the entire game forgetting, quote unquote, to warn us of dangers before they are too late. The little flourishes like that are just the start. The start of a series that in many respects won't really come into its own to some degree until the next game, 1990's Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. Yes, when it's finally revealed Big Boss has been your true enemy and target all along, by today's standards, we see it coming miles away. In some ways, this was simply also an homage to a similar plot twist of Yuji Horii's Portopia. Metal Gear used Big Boss to subvert the default expectation that the game be to some degree outside its own magic circle. When you're asking Big Boss for help or following his orders, you see, you aren't doing so outside the confines or the space of the game because Big Boss is a character in this game, meaning we're naive just to go along with what he tells us. In the process, the awful power of this new medium, in theory, to dictate and condition player instincts and response was, by Metal Gear 87, put at least on somewhat of a display. Metal Gear used the medium to talk about what only it best could, control. We control Snake, while Big Boss and behind him the designers, including Hideo Kojima, control us. It was a genius new approach to this medium in more ways than one. The interplay between gameplay and story, player and protagonist, is best expressed in Kojima's rationale he'll later give for naming our avatar Snake. Quote, Snake was the most appropriate symbol of a living thing that hides his presence and sneaks without any noise, end quote. But as to why Snake's not named something more specific like Cobra or Mamba, Kojima said tellingly, quote, because the protagonist is the player, end quote. We are, as individuals, the Cobra or the Viper in this scenario. It is collectively in the visage of the character mold that we become Snake. At this time, another thing home computer and console games start doing differently is providing an ability to save your progress. 1986's Legend of Zelda is the first console title to feature saving. On the MSX, this is done using a cassette tape and data recorder. Amazingly, now, roughly 40 years later, MSX program files can actually still be played back, now as audio signal over smartphones. These rudimentary features like saving offered by the MSX were crucial to Metal Gear's creation. So crucial, in fact, they'd show up as part of the game itself by the final two entries, Ground Zeroes and The Phantom Pain. We may take saving for granted now, but back then it was a revolutionary advancement for gaming as a private homebound affair. This shift can also be found by looking at a translation of the original Metal Gear manual. It not only provides key backstory and starting tips as you might expect, the manual also helps get the player into the right mindset, the right private mental space within which to play out our espionage role. The manual tells us standard procedure for our Special Forces unit, Foxhound, is infiltration while naked. All weapons and items must be procured on site. We learn the enemy's attack helicopter, a Hind D, fires 4,000 rounds a minute, and that our mechanical nemesis, Metal Gear TX-55, can run up to 50 kilometers an hour. Little details like these would go a long way in getting us into the right headspace. 
In the European manual, we read that Foxhound was first formed to fight terrorism and fight in regional small-scale conflicts, formed for political covert operations. The enemy force is led by an elite cadre of mercenaries and former special forces. One boss character, Dirty Duck, is a terrorist, whose boss fight may include some of the earliest depictions of hostage-taking in video games. Snake has to take care not to hurt these civilians, especially since one of them happens to be the brother of a key contact, Jennifer. Calling the player Snake directly, the manual even gives you a half-complete flowchart for you to follow at the start of the game. The manual says this was started by your predecessor before his signal went dark, Gray Fox. All these little details in the manual illustrate what kind of game Metal Gear was meant to be, and how different home computer and console games were becoming from the arcade. Remember Game Planners and how important I said their existence in the MSX branch of Konami was to Kojima's initiation into the world of game design and the eventual construction of the Metal Gear series? Well, one reason the manual for the original Metal Gear is so well made is thanks to the standard operating procedure for Konami's MSX teams, which was for the packaging, sales pitch, design, and manuscripts for game manuals, all to be handled by the same core dev team. In turn, led, of course, by the same game planner. That being said, again, the MSX branch projects were often a group effort. It would be some time before Kojima, individually, would have complete directorial control. The infamous box art for Metal Gear that rips off James Cameron's The Terminator, Kojima actually had nothing to do with. He'd tweet in 2014, I was a newcomer and couldn't get involved in the packaging at all. Instead, the box art for Metal Gear merely followed the trend of other Konami titles at the time, which, to varying degree, paid homage, or just plagiarized, pop cultural iconography outside the gaming medium. Games were not yet taken seriously as culture of their own. They had to rely on easily tapped into symbols residing in the public mind to better stimulate that most primary of importances during this prehistoric gaming era, the player's imagination. Special Forces Commandos going toe-to-toe -to -toe may have just made for a great game scenario, but as it would so happen, as the Cold War will start to end, terrorism, mercenaries, and regional strife, all in other words, the real contexts that Metal Gear draws from, will become central to the new geopolitical status quo, with its South African setting and inclusion, even if only on paper, of real-world SOFs or Special Operations Forces like Spetsnaz, the SAS, and GSG-9, Curiously, Metal Gear fused together a grounded pseudo-realism and manga or anime-style escapism. This fusion would only grow in relevance after the Cold War's end. And because of this fusion, it meant that although technically a game about a giant robot with cyborgs and body doubles and so on, Metal Gear could still say things with implications for the real world. The titular robot, TX-55, is a nuclear bipedal tank that can adapt to any terrain and attack from any location on Earth. Outer Heaven is a fortress micronation in South Africa founded by mercenaries active in the region's proxy wars throughout the 1980s. Though far off in the periphery, Metal Gear was toying with politically charged themes. This potential for the series to say something subversive and truly meaningful would get realized only gradually over time. But so too would Metal Gear grow over time in terms of its defining characteristics and recurring traditions, many of them established first by this game. The original contained many elements later fans would surely recognize. Snake uses a box, smokes cigarettes with secret uses. The only use for the cigarettes was actually to slow down the timer at the end of the game. Snake fights a Hind D and a tank. He gets caught and has to escape without his gear. Snake sneaks across tank hangers and, again using his cardboard box, hitches rides on the enemy's supply trucks. Snake faces down infrared lasers, invisible mines, and gun cameras. Though primitive today, Metal Gear 87 is still the series' wellspring, its most basic, essential, original substance. It was a well-made MSX title and a strong debut for Hideo Kojima. 
but it was only the beginning of a relationship between Kojima and Metal Gear that would, for better and for worse, come to define much of his career. Metal Gear 87 paved the way for a completely new kind of game, a game that Kojima's crew would start by 1990 to call Tactical Espionage, but that we'll get to next time. Even if Metal Gear 87 matters very much to the story of how Kojima will achieve his dreams, it's also historic for being simply one of the better Konami-made MSX titles. Did this video get 25,000 views in the first two weeks? We'll return with Episode 2, covering 1990's Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. Until next time, boss.